Hey guys, my name is Tom, and in this tutorial we're going to talk about how to set up dynamic water physics in Unity. Over the last few months, several people have commented on my devlogs asking me how my ship's buoyancy system works. The very basics would only take a few sentences to explain, so instead of making an extremely short video about it, I figured I might as well turn it into a tutorial. Before we jump into it, I want to quickly go over the theory behind the system we're about to set up, and why I do it this way in my own project. Essentially, depending on the size of the object which is supposed to float, we'll take one or more points around it and apply an upwards force based on how far underwater that point is. I came up with this solution after trying other options which I found online, but which didn't fit my needs. The one I remember best produced more physically accurate results, but was much more resource intensive because it relied on creating an extra mesh that covered the entirety of the floating object's submerged surface area. It's certainly a viable way of handling buoyancy, but if you're anything like me, you don't need 100% physical accuracy for your game. I'd prefer to have something that looks and feels pretty good, but saves some processing power which I can make better use of elsewhere. If that sounds good to you, then keep watching. Alright, so I've opened up a fresh Unity project using the universal render pipeline, although the pipeline you use doesn't really matter since the code we'll be writing has nothing to do with graphics. First of all, I'm just going to delete the tutorial info and example assets folders, as well as the simple camera controller script. Then we'll create a new scene, open it up, and delete the sample scene. I'll also adjust the lighting settings, but this isn't actually necessary. Next, let's create a plane for the water, as well as the material so we can change the color and transparency. Make sure to remove the water plane's mesh collider. Now add a cube to the scene, which will be the first floating object. Attach a rigid body to the cube and give it a small amount of drag. With that done, let's actually write some code. Create a new script called floater and open it up. We'll need a reference to the rigid body and two floats. In a fixed update method, check if the floater's y position is less than zero, in which case we'll consider it to be underwater, meaning we need to apply buoyancy forces to the cube. Inside the if statement, we'll calculate the displacement multiplier by taking the floater's y position, inverting it to make it positive, dividing it by the depth before submerged value, and then clamping that between 0 and 1. This will somewhat approximate a percentage of how much of the object is submerged, which affects how strong the buoyancy force will be. The reason we clamp the value between 0 and 1 is because once an object is fully submerged, the buoyancy force stays the same regardless of how far underwater the object is. We'll also multiply the whole thing by the displacement amount. Then add an upwards force to the rigid body with a y component equal to the force of gravity multiplied by the displacement multiplier. We'll use the acceleration force mode because the buoyancy force shouldn't be affected by the object's mass. Back in Unity, attach the floater script to our cube and assign the rigid body to the appropriate slot. Then hit play. You should see the cube bobbing up and down in the water, although it's extremely bouncy. This is largely due to the fact that it barely has any drag, even underwater. If you increase the drag, you'll notice that the cube comes to rest fairly quickly. Before we deal with that though, let's make it so that the cube floats on the water surface, no matter where that is, instead of assuming that it will always be at zero on the y-axis. Create a new script called Wave Manager and open it up. Inside, we'll set up a basic singleton. If you don't know what that is, it will essentially allow us to access a specific instance of this class from anywhere in the project while also ensuring that there's only ever one instance in existence. We're going to use a basic sine wave function to simulate water waves, so we'll need fields for the amplitude, wavelength, speed, and offset. In an update method, we'll increment the offset by the speed multiplied by time.delta time. Below, create a method which will return the wave height at a given x coordinate. Inside, we'll just take the x coordinate, divide it by the length, add the offset, and pass that to the sine function. Then we'll return the result multiplied by the amplitude. Now that we can easily grab the wave height of a given point in the world, we need to incorporate this into our buoyancy code. In the floater class's fixed update method, get the wave height at the floater's x position. Instead of checking if the floater's y position is less than zero, we'll now check if it's less than the wave height. Also, in our displacement multiplier calculation, we need to subtract the y position from the wave height before dividing it by depth before submerged. In the wave manager class's awake method, make sure the if statement has a double equals sign. I accidentally only used one. Back in the editor, attach the wave manager script to our water plane and then enter play mode. You should see the cube bobbing up and down as before, except this time it should look like it's floating on waves. However, we can't actually see those waves yet, so let's deal with that. 
Create a script called Water Manager, attach it to our water plane, and open it up. Anything that we attach this to should also have a mesh filter and mesh renderer component, so we'll enforce that with some require component attributes. Add a field to store a reference to the mesh filter and assign it in the awake method. In an update method, we'll grab the mesh's vertices. Then we need to loop through the array and modify the y components based on the global x components. Finally, reassign the vertices to the mesh and then call the recalculate normals method to make sure the mesh's normals are correct. Now we can see that the cube does in fact float in relation to the wave height. Next, we'll take care of how larger objects float, so create a second cube, add a rigid body with some drag, and scale it up a bit. Then add an empty child object, position it in one corner, attach the floater script, and assign the rigid body to the appropriate slot. Create three duplicates of the floater and adjust their positions so that one is in each corner of the cube. If you run this now, you'll see that the cube is extremely bouncy and it doesn't rotate at all. Reopen the floater class and instead of using the add force method, we'll call add force at position and pass in the floater's position. Now the cube rotates, although gravity is still only being applied at the center, so it will never rotate because gravity is pulling one side down. To fix this, we can simply use the add force at position method to apply gravity at the floater's position. Gravity acts on the cube regardless of whether or not it's submerged, so make sure to do this outside the if statement. Of course, the cube will now behave as though quadruple the normal gravity is being applied, because that's exactly what we're doing. At the top, add a new field for how many floaters an object has. Then we can divide the gravity force which we're applying by the number of floaters. Back in Unity, select all four of the cube's floaters and change the floater count value to 4. At this point, let's apply some drag. Add two new fields, one for the water drag and one for the water angular drag. Below, inside the if statement, we'll add a force equal to the displacement multiplier multiplied by the rigid body's negative velocity, the water drag, and time.fix delta time. Use the velocity change force mode. Do the same with the rigid body's angular velocity, but multiply it by the water angular drag instead. If you play around with these values now, you'll probably find that the cube behaves very strangely, particularly when you increase the angular drag. This is because we shouldn't be applying the angular drag with the add force method. We should be using the add torque method, so make sure you change that. Now you can play around with the buoyancy values until you find something that you like. You can also adjust the local y position of the floaters to see how that affects the results. However, there's one more very important thing which I forgot. Since we're manually applying gravity in our buoyancy code, we should disable the built-in gravity of the rigid bodies. Additionally, you can adjust the wave equation however you like, which can produce some extreme looking swells. One thing to note is that we are currently manipulating vertices at runtime on the CPU, which isn't very efficient. With just a single plane, you probably wouldn't have noticed a performance drop, however if I duplicate the water several times and then open the stats panel, you'll see that this runs at around 800 frames per second. If I disable all the water manager components which are responsible for manipulating the mesh, my frames jump up to about 1100. A gain of 300 fps is pretty huge, especially considering how little area these objects are covering. In my own project, I don't manipulate vertices on the CPU. Instead, I do it on the GPU by using a shader, which allows me to simulate pretty large planes of water with a very small impact on performance. Also, instead of having just one sine wave go from left to right, you can stack multiple waves on top of one another, each using different parameters. This can help produce much more interesting and realistic looking wave formations. However, even better than multiple sine waves are Gerstner waves. In my game, I've stacked four Gerstner waves to make my water look the way it does. If you're interested in manipulating vertices with a shader or using Gerstner waves, I'll leave a link in the description to a great article by Cat Like Coding which covers both. Just keep in mind that you'll need to adjust the wave manager's formula to mimic whatever equation you use in the shader. Finally, if you want to set up boat movement now, you should be able to simply apply a force in the boat's forward direction and a rotational force based on inputs. And just like that, you've got a basic boat controller. Anyways, that'll be it for this tutorial. If you enjoyed it or found it helpful, make sure to annihilate the like button and let me know what you think in the comments. Also, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to make sure you never miss one of my videos. With that said, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again next time.